What Drives You is brought to you by Ziggler, your premier source for equipping life and leadership coaches. Visit Ziggler.com and let them inspire your true coaching performance. Yeah. Welcome to What Drives You. I'm Kevin Miller, your host and guide to help you master your inner drive so you can live a driven, inspired, and peaceful life that sees you driving further and enjoying the ride. In this episode, we're starting a series on conflict, though more specifically, the possibilities within and around conflict. And we seem to be a world more at conflict than ever. And we can ask why, but where it starts is with us. And chances are, as you're listening right now, you have a list of people in your lives who you're struggling with or distanced from because of conflict. So how can you, how can I better steward conflict in our lives and from there in the worlds around us. So my guest and expert on the topic is William Urey. William is one of the world's best known experts on negotiation. He's the co-author of Getting to Yes. That's the world's all-time best-selling book on the topic with more than 15 million copies sold. He's co-founder of Harvard's program on negotiation and has devoted his life to helping people, organizations, and nations transform conflicts literally around the world, helping serve as a negotiator and a lot of the toughest disputes of our times. He's consulted with the White House, the State Department, the Pentagon, so many countries. He served as a negotiation advisor and mediator in conflicts raising, ranging from Kentucky wildcat coal mine strikes to family feuds from U.S. partisan battles to wars in the Middle East, Colombia, Korea, Ukraine. And my focus in this series is primarily on the greatest battlefront. I think, which is the world we live in personally, in our homes and in our work, our personal relationships. And my muse for this, really the construct that we're going to be going through is William's brand new book. Uh, it's, pos it's called Possible, How We Survive and Thrive in an Age of Conflict. Uh, so Bill, what a gift to have you with us. Thank you. Huge pleasure, Kevin. Well, I am, uh, your book is fascinating. I do want to point that out. As much as we're going to talk about this on an individual front for the most part, my gosh, what you have been involved in literally around the world is, is, is mind blowing. It's intriguing, but it also is an incredible, uh, framework to put around these concepts. Uh, so thank you for that. Thank you for the book that you put in there. And I did want to start off where you start off in the book as you, and I appreciate this as we're, viable neighbors, a couple hours apart here in Colorado, and you enjoy the mountains, it sounds like, as I do. And one of your buddies is Jim Collins, who most people are going to know is the author of Good to Great. And you guys are out on a hike, which uh, again, I, I can feel this. And you're having a discussion. It's one of my greatest places to have discussions with friends and myself and God for that matter. And he says, all right, Bill, if you had to boil your life's work down to just one sentence, you could leave behind what would it say? I won't read it. I'll, I'll ask you to recite that for us. The path to possible is to go to the balcony, build a golden bridge, mm -hmm. and engage the third side. And I can explain how I explained that to Jim at the time, but that, that's what it boiled down to, Kevin. Well, I will say too, and this is relevant for my listeners, that when this comes out, I will likely have, uh, I don't know where I'll be, but about um, just a handful of days ago, uh, received a life ending diagnosis from my dad. Uh, and so when I read this in your book, I actually copied it and sent it to my family. And he's pondering that uh, mm. right now. So that's an acute thought to do. And so uh, thank you for leading off the book with that. It was very appropriate. And yeah, so we're going to unpack that um, and unpack the structure of that. I do want to ask about conflict in general. So I'm going to ask you for a 10,000 foot view on conflict. Fair? Sure. I just want to say, uh, yeah, my, my heart goes out to you and to your dad and your family. Thank you. It's significant. Yeah. When this comes out, uh, along with your book coming out, I don't know where we'll be. He may not be with us at that point. So, uh, this is, this is acute. Thank you. Um, boy, what a time to resolve any conflict. Uh, I want to hit on that just conflict in general. And I know you unpack this a lot, but you got me again to thinking about 
why it is so volatile to us. If I say I like coffee and you like tea, okay, that's fine. I'm, I'm not hurt by that. Now, if we're going on a road trip and we got only take a thermos of one, uh, we might we might have a discussion uh, on that. But it so often feels like when there's a difference, it is a threat. We're talking about our faiths, our beliefs, our, our, our very beings. And conflict has got to, where did, has it always been that way? Or have we let it get out of hand to be so much greater than it should be volatile again? That's a really good question, Kevin. Um, I would say, you know, I used to think conflict was a kind of a bad thing, but actually I've come to realize, I'm a studied anthropology, you know, I'm a study, st- student of human beings and human nature. And I would say conflict is natural. I've come to understand it's natural. It's part of life. Uh, and it even can be healthy. The key is, how do we deal with conflict? Uh, do we deal with it destructively, as we often do, just the way you're describing? You know, we get, we, we get small, we get fearful, we get angry, we get reactive. As the old saying goes, we make speeches <laughs> we regret. And, um, and the key is to see if we can change our mindset, change, you know, go from reactive to proactive, think about what we really want, what's really important in life, and focus on that. That's, that's, that's what I call going to the balcony. That's that, it's almost like you're negotiating on a stage, and part of you, mind goes to a, goes to a, a balcony overlooking that stage, and a, an emotional, a mental, a spiritual place that's kind of like you get a larger perspective. You can see what's really important. And from that perspective, you can put conflict in its proper place because that's the trouble is I think right now, why I wrote this book and why Jim Collins challenged me with that question is we're living through times of pretty intense conflict and it looks like it's intensifying. It looks like it's polarizing us. It's even poisoning some of our relationships. It's uh, paralyzing us from doing what's important and what needs to be done. And so I wrote this book to kind of see if I could propose a slightly different way of looking at conflict where you lean into it, you treat animosity with curiosity, and you, uh, you change your mindset, and you tap into what I think is a theme of yours, which is you tap into possibility, you tap into human potential. I, you mentioned this at the beginning of the book, that it's, it's of course, just elementary but reasonable to, to wonder why. Why do we have a more conflict? And you don't necessarily give that. That's not the focus of the book. We do have conflict. What do we do with it? But I know people are going to ask it. I, I thought that too. And you kind of ponder and go, right now, when we look at the media, we look at the volatility out there, and we keep using that word volatile. That's what conflict seems to have gotten to. Uh, though, I, though I'm also going to come to why you see it as not something that should be. But when we do, it is hard not to question why. Are we really more at odds? Is it just because we can more easily uh, communicate our odds? Um, it, but as people ponder that, any thoughts towards that? Is it just a more uh, just a bigger proliferation of our of our? It's easy to express our opinions, or are we really seeming to be more at odds than normal? I, I think we're more at odds than normal, at least than I can remember. I can't remember a time in my life when there's been more conflict around us that's manifesting, whether in families and workplaces in our democracy and in our larger world. And I think it's partly the result of the fact that the pace of change is picking up and change brings all kinds of change brings conflict um, whenever there's change. And the other thing is, I think the way in which we communicate, like you're mentioning, Kevin, increasingly through social media, where the algorithm is built in to actually increase engagement, since conflict increases engagement, anger increases engagement, the very way in which we're communicating actually tends to amplify the conflict. That one is uh, daunting. Yeah, we know that I've seen, you know, really wise statements, I think, on that so easy just to spout off an opinion that we wouldn't uh, no different than, you know, we act in our cars in ways we would never do in the grocery aisle uh, as well. Your book, though, Bill, I will say as I was reading it, and again, considering myself and my own issues with conflict and then looking at the culture, I also, it got me to wondering, as you talk about being on the balcony, which we're, we're, we'll get into here, and and being able to step back 
having the personal awareness, awareness, having the confidence even and the security uh, of the uh, being able to step back on the balcony when we have more conflict i'm prone to wondering is it because we're less connected with ourselves is it a individual standpoint i believe in the end i mean the you know the very first person you have to deal with in conflict is yourself i've often found i look at you know i think about negotiation i think you know what's the biggest block to us getting what we want in negotiation and I can tell you, even though negotiation tends to focus on influencing the other side, yeah. the number one block to getting what we want is right here. It's me. Yeah. <laughs> it's us. It's the person I look at in the mirror every morning. It's my tendency to react. And if we can, if we can do some work on ourselves, we can learn to influence ourselves. We're going to have a lot better chance of being able to influence people around us and, and the world generally. It did bring me back to thinking uh, of a guy, another author, Andy Norman. He wrote a book called Mental Immunity. And the series we did with him, it's been uh, probably a year, if not two years, was on beliefs. And when we look at this, again, I look at the conflicts and I've been doing a lot of study. Uh, I've been following um, the writings of Anthony DeMello lately. Mm his perspectives on attachment and coming to Andy Norman's perspective of our beliefs and how we don't look at them as just something that we believe or even say we have faith in. We really attach them to our, our identity. So now when you say, uh, when I say, Oh my gosh, I love coffee. And you go, well, gosh, I like tea. Well, the coffee, I, I've, I've made a stand place, a soapbox. I really believe in coffee. Uh, I believe it's best. I believe it's better than for the environment. It's better for our health. It's better. Uh, I'm being facetious. I, I've, I've actually switched the tea lately. But uh, point being, do you find that that we are so? It's a it's a security. It's a personal. It's a self image issue as much as anything. When we enter into conflict, that we are so attached to these issues that we come into conflict conflict with. I think you're right, Kevin. I think uh, uh, increasingly things that weren't part of our identity, maybe because we're you know, we're in an age where there's so much up for grabs. And one of the key questions a lot of people are asking themselves, who am I? <laughs> who am I really? And and so, and so, and a lot of the traditional identities are kind of under siege or weakening a little bit. And so individuals are a little bit lost. And so, yeah, so so you attach a lot more to 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 coffee and tea than than you might normally if you actually were able to go to the balcony and see. What is really important in life? What, 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 who am I really? And what is, what is life about really? And that's, that's why I love to walk in the mountains because the mountains, you know, it don't matter what's going on in the world. You know, I shut down the screen, I get out in the, in the mountains. They've been there for millions of years. There's solid, there's beauty, there's wonder, there's awe, there's the grace. And so everything goes into perspective. And then I, then things that seem big to me when I was looking at a screen seemed tiny. Agreed. And my gosh, going back to where we started right now with uh, my dad looking at an end, end of life diagnosis, the same thing, everything that has seemed, you know, it's, it's, it's pithy and elementary to say, but I'm living it out and I'm looking and going, Oh my gosh, the pithy things that I'm wrapped up in that do they really matter? I do want to ask you when you talk about, if we're talking about personal identity, so much of your book are stories that you have experienced as a conflict negotiator around literally around the globe. That is it a similar thing? Is it even there? It's this, the country they're fighting because of the country's identity that they're holding on to, and they're not able to step on the balcony with. I would say yes. And you know, the thing is funny because we, you know, when you think things are very big, you know, okay, they're, they're countries that are fighting about, you know, big things like who's in power of the country and where are the economic resources and the oil and everything. I remember being impressed by this years ago. I was working in the country of Venezuela, trying to mediate between the opposition and the president, who was the guy, well-known guy by the name of Hugo Chavez. And the thing I was struck when I met with Chavez was, um, you know, I asked him at one point, what could your, what could your rivals, your enemies do tomorrow morning that would give you a sense that maybe they were worth talking to? 
Hmm. And the first thing he said to me was, they could stop going on television and calling me a mono, which is a monkey in, in, uh, in Spanish. And it was kind of like, he took it as a kind of racist allusion to some of his indigenous, you know, heritage and so on. It was like, but I could just see his face and it was like so much of conflict boils down to people's sense of dignity. They, everyone wants respect. Yeah. Yeah. And the thing I found is that the cheapest concession you can make in any conflict, in any negotiation is give the person a little bit of respect. In other words, treat them with the dignity with which you would like to be treated. Huh. It's okay. And your other statement too, Bill, about change resonated that we are in, it feels hard. I think on one hand, everybody wants to say, oh my gosh, there's been change for eons going on. You know, back in the day when our great grandparents got electricity, what could it be a bigger change than that? But it does feel like it's more rapid. I mean, I think we feel pretty confident that it is now more rapid. And you're saying with change comes conflict. That in itself, by proxy, change period is often conflict in and of itself because there's a lot of times we just don't want change. However, it looks That makes sense. So again, which is timely for your book to be here, that this is not going to slow down. If anything, it's going to keep ramping up. These changes are going to continue. We're going to continue to be in discomfort, in the need to, gosh, ever since COVID pivots, one of my primary words, it seems, we're going to have to be able to pivot and deal with conflict. And so take us to, to, let's break down the balcony. Uh, I've got some specific questions on that for you, but, but give us a definition of that. So here's conflict. And this is, you know, you're at your office and, and dealing with work. You're with your spouse, you're with your kid, whatever. And boom, there you are, you know, conflicts happen. You can feel it in you. And you're saying, okay, this is your opportunity possi- for possibilities to go to the balcony. Define that for us. So the balcony is simply a, that place of calm and perspective where you can keep your eyes on the prize and you can see the bigger picture. And we all have the balcony within us. In fact, you know, neuroscientists would kind of locate it more with the prefrontal cortex, you know? It's the, it's the part that uh, can think, but can also feel and like, remember what's important. You know, um, going back to that conversation with Chavez for a moment, you know, at one point, maybe it was a different meeting, he lost it. Uh, I'd, he'd asked me how things are going in the country. And I said, well, I think your ministers and your people, you know, and the opposition are making some progress. He said, progress? What are you talking about? Uh, you know, are you a fool? Are you blind? You know, you third parties, you're naive. And he proceeded to lean closely into my face and shout at me for approximately 30 minutes. And, you know, for me, that was the kind of a moment where I felt embarrassed. I felt like all my work had gone down the drain. <laughs> you know, I was thinking, rehearsing what I could say in response. I'm thinking I would have soiled myself in your. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, I was feeling why. Well, you know, it brings back memories. You know, being like in a classroom when you're ten, being ridiculed for the way I'm writing French or something like that. And and uh, and then a friend of mine had t- taught me a very simple technique. He said, "Bill, when you're in a tough situation, pinch the palm of your hand." And I said, Hernan, why would I pinch the palm of my hand? And he said, well, because it'll give you a momentary pain. It'll keep you alert. And so that's what I did at that moment is I pinched the palm of my hand to go to the balcony and then ask myself, which is something we can all do. And, you know, whether it's a president or whether it's your spouse shouting at you or someone else putting you on the spot like that, your boss, is if you can just bite your tongue for a second and then ask yourself, what do I really want here? And that's what I was able to ask is, is it going to do me any good if I get into a, <laughs> an argument or a shouting match with the president of Venezuela will throw me out, you know? So I just bit my tongue and I listened from a balcony perspective, from that place we all have inside of us, that place of calm and perspective, where I could kind of watch it a little bit like a play. And I could then ask myself, what's he doing? Is this he's trying to impress his cabinet ministers he was, <laughs> he was in front of? What, what's actually going on here? And by taking that, and then by not feeding him, not feeding that anger, you know, he could go on for eight hours talking, but after about 30 minutes, I saw his shoulders sink slowly. And in a weary tone of voice, he said to me, so, Bill, what should I do? And that 
is the faint sound of a human mind opening. And that was my opportunity to actually ask him <laughs> to think about going to the balcony and, and, uh, and, and, and asking his country to go to the balcony. So I think we all have that opportunity at any moment to, that's maybe the greatest power we have, which is the power not to react, but to go to the balcony, think about what's best for us, think about what's going to promote harmony in the family, what's going to move the thing forward at work, or what's going to avoid a war in a, in a political situation. Let's exaggerate it in the personal front when you are with someone you care about and you have conflict, you have this, you have the yell, you know, like like what you got with Chavez. And of course, naturally we're going to have feelings. We're going to have an emotion that comes up and it could be fear. It could be anger. It could be disgust. It could be even the fact of justice, like, Oh my gosh. And and if they'd gone further and if he did, and I don't know if he did this, but if he just said, you're, you know, you're an idiot, Bill, you're (laughs) pretty much, how how on earth did you get the, the, the opportunity to get in front of me, get out? You know, so we're thinking about justice and, and the unfairness and, and, and all these emotions and the reactions. Of course, you cover this well in the book. We are, our body is naturally wired probably our survival to react. It's doing what it's supposed to do. It is. And you're saying, yes. And we have, uh, we have the opportunity, the possibility of evolving above that easy to say. And of course, when you're in there and from a counseling standpoint and you get that trigger, let's put it and you talk about marriage in the book somewhat, let's put it with your spouse, somebody who it's the most, oh, the most sensitive to who you most want the opposite from. I mean, that's a big, that's a big call to jump out of self and to be able to step back and do that. And here's my question for you with it, Bill, because as I've done that literally in my own, I know I can also have the tendency and because somehow you stayed checked in with him. You still stayed checked in with him enough that he was still with you and then came back to you as opposed to, and I'll own this, that sometimes I can do that, but I have withdrawn yeah. even to, even to, from a, again, go to counseling perspective. I, I've stonewalled. I'm just waiting for them to get, get finished so I can get out of there. And maybe that's the point. So reconcile that with me. That's, this is what, I mean, it's, you know, the principle, the superpower that we all have is the power to go to the balcony. The question is, how do we hone that superpower? How do we develop it? How do we use it? Particularly when it's, you know, when our buttons are getting pressed, you know, like with, 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 our, with our spouse or in some kind of family situation or whatever it is. Um, the, What I, what I think in conflict, we often fall into what I would call the 3A trap. And uh, one of the A's, and which I also do too, I'm talking too, is avoid. And that's what, you know, when you withdraw, you're avoiding, you know, you're, you know, you're sitting on it. You, what I mean, uh, you know, and avoiding, you know, we, we tend to avoid a lot or we, or we attack, you know, that's the other A, you know, which, you know, an eye for an eye and we all go blind. Or we accommodate, we just give in. And what I'm suggesting is a fourth, which is to engage. Um, and it has a little bit, you know, it has a little bit of avoidance in that, and there was the ability to withdraw a tiny bit, but to stay engaged, just like you were saying. It has a little bit, it has the assertiveness of aggression without the destructiveness, and it has the empathy that's in accommodation without the submission. And that's what you're, it's like a razor's edge that you're finding, but it's that place inside of you of presence where, and this is the tricky thing, of simultaneously detach in order to listen. So it's like, you know, there's a kind of a two cycle there. You withdraw a little bit, you go to the balcony in order to pay closer attention to what's going on on the stage. And what, what you're saying, and I've often found that myself, is we get stuck in that first stage and we don't go to the second stage which is to re-engage. Well, that aspect of engaging, you know, I think about that again in our close personal relationships. So when you have that standpoint and you realize, okay, maybe you feel attacked right now. Okay, conflict just happened and I feel attacked. I have feel that trigger. And what's your body language? What was your body language to Chavez? I, I imagine it was still very respectful. You weren't sitting there rolling your eyes. You didn't clench your fist. You probably tried to keep your shoulders down. I mean, there's some things back to your aspect of respect yeah. where you still act respectful. So can we do that to our, our spouse, our kid, our boss, our yeah. employee, or whoever it may be 
and, and from a body language standpoint, so that they know that we we now we step backward and let them do their thing, but we're still engaged. That feels like a big, well, you said kind of a razor's edge, but dramatically important. Very important, and maybe the easiest way to do it. Something we can all do. We do naturally is just take a deep breath. You know, because oftentimes in conflict, our breathing gets shallow and we forget to breathe because we're tense. And just take a deep breath. Just take two, take three. You know, a little bit of silence actually is a good thing. Uh, We often treat silence like it's uncomfortable, but actually silence is a real tool for us. A little bit of silence. Take a deep breath. That's like the easiest way to go to the balcony in the on the spot. Obviously, if you have a chance to take a break, a coffee break, a tea break, uh, go for a walk, go for a run, go for a workout, go for a bike ride, you know, all the better, go for a hike up in the mountains. But, uh, but if you don't have that moment, just taking a deep breath, pausing, it's that pause. It's the power of a pause. It's okay to pause. You don't always have to fill up the space. And actually, I have a colleague at MIT who's been studying negotiation. And all he does is measure the amount of silence in the conversation. And he finds there's a high rate of correlation between the silence and how cooperative the negotiation turns out to be. Because it's more, there's more presence, there's more balcony in that space. It's funny. It's, it's one of the things that I focus on in the shows here. Because I have a propensity to talk very fast when I get excited and to jump in. And I know that I I learned from Zig Ziglar, the power of the pause. And it's interesting, speaking of Zig Ziglar from a sales standpoint, you know, we learned that early on to ask, make the ask, well, you know, so sir, it's going to be, you know, $5,000. You ready to sign them down the line and pause and that uncomfortable pause. So that is number one, as you break down balcony in your book and outline that you start with pause. That's number one, which obviously drives us to be present. We've got to be present. We've got to not be stuck in our triggers. And that, you know, I looked at that again, Bill, and reading your book, and I thought that is something that we're not going to hear somebody, if you haven't been practicing this, well, that's the point, practicing, because you're not going to hear this and go, oh, that makes sense. So next time I'm in this, I'm going to pause. No, you won't. You won't at all. If you have not planned this, if you've not practiced this, rehearsed it in, in essence, because as much as I have been uh, doing this, there's not... I'm afraid to say, I don't know if there's a week that goes by that at some point I realize, oh my gosh, I completely missed it. And I reacted. I reacted. This is, this is some Jedi training here. It is. And we all do it. We're, you know, human beings are a reaction machine. So you shouldn't, <laughs> you shouldn't uh, judge yourself in that sense. It's like, it's uh, that the key thing is building it in. And what I find is taking time beforehand, like before a difficult conversation, go for a walk. Do whatever, everyone has their favorite ways of going to the balcony. Some people like to go for a coffee with a friend. Some people like to go for a walk. Some people work out. Some people meditate. Whatever they do, pray. But you you just uh, take a moment, even if it's a minute before you pick up the phone. <laughs> you know, just take a minute to yourself, for yourself, so you can bring your full presence, your full potential, your full positivity, and and bring that actually allows us to listen to the other side and actually see what's going on. Uh, because the reason actually interesting you go to the balcony is to be able to listen first to yourself, what's going on, what are the emotions going on inside of me, I'm feeling uncomfortable, I'm feeling tense, whatever. If you listen to yourself, the emotions tend to subside, they, are, they feel heard. And then, then you're ready to do the same with the other, which is of course the key to success in sales, negotiation, anything, which is the ability to understand where they're coming from, put yourself in their shoes. But you can only put yourself in their shoes if you put yourself in your own shoes first. Well, and I appreciate that. And so in your book, Balcony, number one, you say pause. Number two is zoom in. And it's just, what do I really want? Which, gosh, I mean, Bill, in my own emotion, working on my own emotions. I learned how to perform early on. I've been doing that for a long time. But now to understand what what is at the core of this? You know, what, what do I want? And helps me understand why is that bothering me so much? And as we know, it's again, pithy to say, but it's so seldom the issue at hand, the conflict at hand, the thing that we're, it's not about coffee or tea. It's about why is that important to me? You know, am I, is this a vital thing? And so often I think, you know, I told you that yesterday in here in the studio, I had, um, uh, Arthur Brooks on, and we talked about some of those things, you know, why is it that it gets under our skin? 
Um, why do we let that thing bother us and how the majority of our lives, the things that we are most struggling with in conflict are not big T traumas. They're not life or death. They're more in the coffee tea arena. It may be a little more acute, but it's so often that. Now, again, you're saying this, you're bringing this to us from literally back to that word volatile from situations that could have led to gigantic war uh, even. And yet you're saying it's no different here in our home or our office. It's the same. I, you know, I've, I, I mean, that's one of the things I've, I've enjoyed about doing this for, for, you know, 40, 45 years is that whether it's in family context, whether it's in a coal mine, whether it's in a president's office, whether it's, you know, family feud or a war or civil war, whatever it is, we're all human beings. And it's like, we're, it's the basic principles are the same and it all boils down to people. And if we can know ourselves and we can then help know the others, we have a much better chance of finding those possibilities where things get tough as increasingly they are. Well, you bring us from pause, which we can say it, say it whatever way resonates folks as you're listening, you'll pause, be present, right. be aware, and then zoom in. Okay. What is it? Yeah. Like you said, let's stand in my own shoes real quick and go, what am I feeling? What's up with me? Let's make sure that I'm centered in essence. And then zoom out, look at the, in my paraphrasing, you, you unpack that is, is somewhat of step back and go, okay, what is the bigger picture? Uh, can we say what is, what's really important here? How, how are you unpacking that? Yeah. Uh, when you zoom in, you find out what's really important to you. You know, what's actually going on inside of me? Listen to your, your, your emotions, actually. Sometimes we think of emotions as getting in the way, but actually emotions is emotional intelligence, is the ability, emotions, they're trying to tell us something. They're saying, some need, some basic need of ours is not being addressed. And if we can figure that out, so emotions are signposts to those needs. So you can be curious about it. A, a, a lot of the quality of being on the balcony is being curious, curious about yourself, what's going on. Once you zoom in and you figure out what is it I really want, you know, you, it's what drives you. <laughs> it's like, then you can zoom out and say, well, how am I going to even begin to think about getting there, given all the obstacles in the way? You know, it's like a, it's like a life is often like a labyrinth and you can kind of go to a platform <laughs> overlooking that labyrinth, that balcony and kind of, oh, I can see that's a dead end. No, I can go this way. You can see aspects of the play that you didn't see. You can see people that you've left out, maybe that you need to include. You can see, you can also see, um, we often think that we, we need an agreement. You know, we, we, we need an agreement. Well, do you really? What's your, you know, it, when you, when you zoom out, one of the most important questions to ask yourself is what in negotiation lingo from getting to yes, we call your BATNA, your best alternative to a negotiated agreement. In other words, what are you going to do if for some reason you're not able to reach agreement? What's your plan B? What's your best course of action? You know, if you're not going to be able to resolve this issue right now, how are you going to satisfy your needs? And if you can answer that question, you reassure yourself, you get more confidence, and actually you're more likely to reach agreement. Yeah. I, okay. I pulled that out of your book on that bill that you said, and, and I want to go to that because you said that earlier and, and I want to hit back on it. You said, we need more conflict, not superficial consensus. And so when we go back, so you're just talking about emotions. You've got me thinking about that. So if we're looking at emotions, if I'm aware of my emotions, and here's my question, as I'm aware, when you say that we need more conflict, if we're more aware of our emotions and I have one that is negative, I, you know, a little red flag went up. It's not that I'm just going off with, with every single thing, but you're saying we're probably more well served relationally with ourselves and with others to when that negative emotions up, talk about it, have, have enter into what should be reasonable conflict that even doesn't even have to come to agreement, but it's, well, I guess at the end it's connection. Fair. It, it is connection. I mean, the, it's like leaning into, you know, uh, uh, the year before last, I went down the Grand Canyon and, uh, and it's like two weeks down the Grand Canyon in a raft. And yeah, there's some of the, those are the biggest rapids in North America. And the water was pretty cold. It was, you know, <laughs> it was October. And, uh, and, and, you know, once you're in the Canyon, there's no way out. There's one place I think you can get out. Of, but once you, there's only one way. So you're going to be in there. And you can either decide you're going to resist the experience of getting wet all the time because you're going to get wet and cold all the time, or you can lean into it. And I, I felt like that was an aha for me around conflict too, which is 
we can either resist, get, uh, you know, it's coming, you know, conflict's part of life. There are differences. People have differences in everything. But we can either lean in, be curious, be creative, be cooperative, be empathetic in dealing with it, or we can resist it, get tight, which gets us angry, attack, avoid, you know, give in when giving in doesn't really make much sense. So it's, it's that kind of, oddly enough, embracing conflict in order to transform it, to change it from a destructive form to a constructive form, from, from fighting into dialogue, like you're saying, you know, let's talk about our emotions. And when you take it into that context of, and I read about that, you going through the, uh, the Grand Canyon, I relate to that. I mean, from an athletic standpoint, I was a pro athlete and, and, uh, you know, out here in Colorado, like you, I'm doing rivers and I'm doing, you know, ski runs and I'm doing mountain bike trails. And not only do you have to go through it, it's really the best part. I mean, that's the stories, you know, we talk about, I mean, my last, actually, I, I'm not a big river guy and I did stand up paddle boarding, uh, this year oh, oh, up in Deckers. And, uh, there was a couple rowdy sections to either, either you're going to go hike around for an hour or you're going to go through it. And of course that was the best part. And I, you know, got flipped and thrown and whatever. And that's what we're talking about at the tailgate afterwards. It's great. I'm not so, I'm not so comfortable with that in relationships. Um, and so I hear you in going through and yet, is that the opportunity to connect? Now I know from my standpoint, and this is part of my journey and what we talk about a lot here, I have not done that well. I've avoided, I'm the avoider. I'm the yeah. avoider. I avoid conflict. And when I do that, I am not connecting. If anything, I'm, I'm distancing. I'm putting up, I, I always think of it as it's, I'm putting another brick in the wall is yeah. what I'm doing. Yeah. It should be the glory, but in not doing it well, not perceiving it well, well again, that's why you're here on the show. Um, yeah. We all have a learning edge and your learning edge is avoiding mine is too. <laughs> I'm, I'm with you. I mean, from the beginning, you know, I find that I teach, you know, someone once said to me, you teach what you most need to learn. <laughs> and so for me, that's what, uh, that, 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 when I write a book, I write a book to learn. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Not, and then maybe I've got something to, to pass on what I've learned, but it's, uh, uh, you know, I, I wrote a book, I had troubles, you know, saying no. So I wrote a whole book years ago about the power of a positive no. How do you say no in a way that's positive rather than negative? Uh, and so I'm with you. So if you think of every one of your, the listeners, you know, if you think about it, every one of us has certain learning edges. Some of us, our learning edge might be that we go on the attack. You know? Some of it, the learning edge might be that we accommodate, we just give in. Some of us might be avoid. We all have our learning edges. And actually, some of us actually have all three, because if you think about it often, you know, in, in a, in a, you know we, we avoid for a while, <laughs> we avoid for a while, and then we can't take it anymore and we snap and we go on the attack, you know. At some point, you know, if you just keep on suppressing that emotion, yeah. it eventually explodes, which is why engaging with it is, uh, is, is a better way. I'm curious because I'm sitting here. I went back up to my notes. You talked about the three A a trap, avoid, attack, accommodate that you would think, okay, well, attacking is, you know, because you said, you know, the suggestion is number four is a fourth option is engaging. And you would initially think that, well, gosh, att attacking, that's it, engaging, it's not the right engagement. Right. I'm just, I'm finding a word. It's the path to possible is the fourth one. It's okay. to lean in. Yeah. Uh, it's to embrace. It's to transform conflict. Transform. Transform right. might be, maybe that's the fourth one's better. It's transform. It's like change the form of the conflict. Your our yeah. biggest opportunity always is to, is to change the game because the game oftentimes like in conflict situations, we hunker down, we start to think very small. We start to think it's us versus them, me versus you, that kind of thing. It becomes zero sum. Uh, more for me means less, less for you, vice versa. Right. In fact, so the biggest opportunity I've found in negotiation is life is never a zero sum. It's always like you can both lose, <laughs> you know, like in a marriage, you know, if you're asking who's winning this marriage, your marriage is in serious difficulty yeah. and we can both lose. And, or, and everybody loses, actually, the whole family loses. So it's a lose, lose, lose. Or we can explore ways in which we can all benefit. And that's the real choice in life. Goodness. Yeah, that is, um, I love the, the looking at and transforming, rising above that. I mean, again, I'm looking at my own. So I've, I've gotten to, you know, whatever levels there are of being able to, here it comes, we're in it. Okay. 
I'm aware of what's happening. I can kind of step back. I can see that, but it's, it's still, I'm really looking to avoid it. I'm really looking for it just to end. Can I weather it? That's probably what I do. Can I, I'm just going to weather the storm, go away, hope that it resolves itself, whatnot. And I want to be the, you know, the Jedi. I want to be the, the enlightened, uh, yeah. enlightened guy on the, on the mountain who can hear it, who can say again, probably like what you did, hopefully, or what you, you, you ended up doing with Chavez, hear it, weather it for a moment, and then engage. And it's not about me. It's not my self-worth. This is not, this is not good. This is not life or death. Usually, hopefully, but even if it is, my gosh, if you go into a, a terrorist, you know, um, aspect or a hostage aspect, we're talking the same thing and it could be life or death, but you're still, you're saying, be calm, zoom in, zoom out. And now how can you transform it? I mean, that's i uh, I'm playing with words and terminology, but that feels like, you know, that's there's an aspect of enlightenment right there. Well, that's, it is an aspect of enlightenment, I guess. And, and, but it's something available to any one of us at any moment. It's not like, and and we're all learning. I, I just want to say, Kevin, this is, you know, transforming conflict can be some of the hardest work human beings can do because in conflict, we naturally get reactive. Um, in conflict, we naturally get positional. We naturally get, you know, you know, into that kind of us versus them kind of mentality. And the biggest opportunity we have, which we all have inside of us, is to change the mindset, yeah. change the game. You change the frame, you change the game. And if you could change the game, you can, there's a bigger game of life to win here. Uh, and, uh, and, and it's available to us. I mean, every one of us, if you think about it, can, you could probably think of occasions when you've gone to the balcony. Right now you're thinking of occasions when you've fallen off the balcony. But yeah. think of all the times you've gone to the balcony. And, you know, I remember... Uh, you know, all of us, even people who are really good at this, we all fall off the balcony. the right. The only question is how fast you can recover. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. I, I, I my vision at the moment was thinking, yeah, I'm up on the balcony and I'm looking for the escape door. Yeah, get out of there. It. Instead of going to to, to yeah. that point, to going to step two, which yeah. is what you did with Chavez, and and, and right. this is in the book is now it is transformative. How do I engage? How do I transform? Yeah. How do I build a bridge? Which I know, let me list out the three aspects there. So he says the next we're building a bridge, listen, create and act. And back to there, listen, actually, I'm looking at my notes here that I just now hit on. And when I wrote, listen, I did write connect. This is the time. That's it. Fair. Okay. Now that's exactly, that's the time to connect. Balcony is about connecting with yourself Okay. Because what you know, okay. what you're talking about, when you when you avoid, you're actually getting disconnected from yourself. Yeah. Because you're shutting down. Balcony is the opposite of that. It's about taking a step back to connect with yourself, to listen to yourself first and ask, how am I feeling? You know, notice your feelings, like you were saying. Yeah. That actually, once you really listen to yourself, you put yourself in your shoes. You've asked yourself, what do I really want? You've zoomed out and seen the larger picture of how you might get there. Now you're ready to do what is the most important thing in negotiation, which is to listen, put yourself in their shoes, try and understand where they're coming from, what drives them, so that you can then move to create, which is can we create an option here, a way forward that meets their needs and meets yours at the same time. Is it relevant then to bring in, I mean, this is, you know, structured aspects of listening that I think a lot of people, a lot of us have heard doesn't mean that we do it well, but we're talking about really listening. Listen is not just because I can do that. I can sit there and listen does not mean that I understand or I care to. And so yeah. in your, in your work, literal yeah. work, you're listening and you are, when you're sitting there with you know, the president of a country, you got to understand. And so That's if it. you don't, I imagine you're asking questions. That's absolutely, you know, negotiation, first of all, <laughs> is much more about listening than it's about talking. Yeah. And it's much more about asking questions than it's about making statements. Yeah. You get those two things straight, you're a long ways down the road. And the listening, it's not just listening, it's what kind of listening. You know, the, the usual kind of listening is we're 
in our shoes and we're listening and our mind is going, I agree with that. I disagree with that. And whenever this and that, you know, no, I'm talking about a listening where you put yourself in the other side shoes. You, it's like, there's a, it's like, there's a, uh, uh, a, a beam of light, you know, the, 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 the focus needs to move over from where you are to where they are. And you are then tapping into them. You're using empathy. You're listening. You're listening from within their skin. That's a hard thing to do. And we can only do that if we've gone to the balcony beforehand, if we're in that place of common perspective. You can't do it if you're reactive. And if you can do that, if you can start to put yourself in their shoes and connect with them as a human being, whether they're a terrorist or whether they're a hostage taker, whatever yeah. they've done, you can connect with them. You're going to have a hundred times more ability to be able to influence them to make the decision you want them to make. And Bill, the hardest place for me has been on the other side of what feels like an attack, an unjust attack. And then to take, to come out of that, again, this is, this would be my, the hardest place for me to do this is to, I had somebody give, and this is probably an old term, but being on the other side of the beach ball, you know, beach balls that have the different colors, you know, and everybody's seeing this happened. And yet everybody said, can I get over there and see the different colored side that so-and-so saw? And, and especially with an attack, can I get over there and go, okay, holy smokes. I did not mean it that way. I did. I was not, blah, blah, blah. but if I get on your side, how, could I have taken it the way that you did? Is that possible? Almost always it is almost always. I can find some aspect of, I don't want to say a truth, but a, a validity I can see how that perspective could have been possible if, you know, if it had been me as well. It's not what I meant, but can I see that? And if I can give that, what are my opportunities to transform the conflict instead of just beating against it? That's it. That's exactly it, Kevin. Because, and when you acknowledge, when you listen and you acknowledge the validity of what the other side says, yeah. That's an act of giving them respect, of saying, I see you, I hear you. It doesn't mean that you agree with them. Yeah. You can acknowledge that they have a valid point of view without and saying, and I have a different point of view. Yeah. You know, uh, it's like it's it's like the beach ball, you know. <laughs> yeah, from your side it looks red, from my side it looks blue, or whatever it is. But it's like uh it's it's that, you know, what you see depends on where you sit. We all sit in different places. Yeah. And, and that ability to do that turns out to be key. And you don't have to, I mean, sometimes people think, I remember once a long time ago, I was giving a talk at the uh, Naval War College in Rhode Island. And, uh, and I was saying, you know, if we're going to try and, inf you know, change, if we're trying to negotiate with the Soviets, we need to put ourselves in their shoes and understand how they see the situation. And one of the captains got up and said, sir, you're asking me to put myself in the Soviet shoes. That might distort my judgment. You know, and, and, I, and I got that. But, you know, even in warfare, the first rule of warfare is know your enemy, right? You've got to know them from inside to understand how they're going to move, what they're going to do. So, so that ability to put ourselves in the other side's shoes isn't just soft. It's the it's it's what we need to do in life to be able to influence people uh, to to find good ways forward. You know, whether it's our spouse, whether it's and or whether it's an adversary for that matter. But but it's like putting ourselves in their shoes is key. If how are we going to be able to influence uh, the other side's mind? How are we going to change the other side's mind if we don't know where their mind is? And probably goes back to Zig Ziglar again. I'm sure in sales or whatever. I'm sure you need to know the customer's mind. Yeah. I'm so enamored by your, your story there uh, of the guy saying, what, did, what was it? You're going to just, that could distort, my, distort judgment. my judgment. Right. And I'm thinking my first thought was, well, I guess that's the point, isn't it? If you're not now, if you're in a state of where the sole goal is to win, then yeah, I don't want to hear, I don't want to see anything. I'm here to, to win, which is not connection back right. to that. So I am asking or in an essence, my, I'm trying to let my judgment get distorted. If I'm going to connect with you, I need that. Is that, that's, Fair enough. That, that, well, exactly. I, I, I mean, you might have put it as distorted, but yes, oh, sure. you need to be able to be influenceable. If you're going to try to influence people, you have to be a little bit influenceable yourself. You have to open yourself up to 
okay, I'm going to expand my perspective of what's going on here by taking in your perspective. It doesn't mean that you have to abandon your perspective. You don't have to give up your identity. You don't have to give up what you believe to be able to, you know, go that extra mile, walk in their moccasins, yeah. you know, just, just like, uh, and, and that, that ability to empathize, which is key, which is a key core human talent. We all have that capability. You know, babies have that capability. It's like the ability to kind of tune into where the other person is. Baby tunes into its mom, right? And is 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 absolutely critical to dealing with conflicts in a healthy way. Well, tell me more about the aspect of a bridge. You're trying to build a bridge. Again, I I, I feel like I conceive of the balcony, uh, of doing that staying engaged. I'm not going to avoid... Uh, I'm going to stay there and now I'm going to come in. I'm going to listen, but your next two aspects are now to create an act. So it's, I feel like that's, I have not done that well, Bill, mm-hmm. the building a bridge. I mean, over, overall, I, I should say, I shouldn't say that. I, I probably have in some ways, but especially in the cute places that are most dear to me, you know, I don't, I've, I've, I don't have a great history of always building a, a bridge. So yeah. listen, okay. I conceive of that. Now it's create an act. Go there. Right. Well, you know, usually, oftentimes in a conflict situation, Kevin, my mind's right here. You know, I'm here, right? Your mind's way over there. It's, you know, when I was walking with Jim Collins, I looked at Canyon, you know, my mind's here. You're way over on the other slope. You know, you know, there's a giant chasm between us, like the Grand Canyon. It's filled with doubt, anxiety, you know, uh, are my needs going to be met here? Uh, what are people going to think of me? Am I going to look weak if I, you know, if I give in? All that. Our job, which is hard to do for a moment, is to leave where our mind is, leave where our thinking is for a moment, and step over to where the other side is and look at where they are, start from where their thinking is, where they're where they're they are, and build them a bridge over that chasm, back to where we want them to be. In other words, build them a golden bridge, an attractive bridge. And that's the key because in negotiation, what we tend to do is particularly when in conflict, we tend to push, you know, it's like I'm pushing my hands against you. And what do you do when no one I'm pushing? You push back and mm-hmm. we're just at a stalemate. What, what successful negotiators do is they start from where the other side is. They listen and then they try to create options for mutual gain. You know, things like, are there ways in which we can meet your needs and meet mine at the same time. Because too often we end up like those, you know, proverbial two sisters quarreling about the orange. We quarrel about the orange. Right. <laughs> and we, you know, one sister, they just divide the orange in half. One sister takes, you know, half the peel and uh, uses it to bake a cake. The other sister takes half the fruit and uses it to make orange juice. In fact, you could end up with a whole peel and a whole orange for both. You know, there's a double as much if they were able to be Think about what is it I really want. I want, you know, if you get to what what's underneath it, the 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 interests underneath the positions, which are wanting to drink orange juice and wanting yeah. to make a cake. So the ability to expand, expand the pie, don't just divide up the pie, expand it before you divide it up. And I'm sure you do that all the time. And you know, you know, in 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 life, that that's that's the critical thing. Is can we can we do something that addresses your needs, helps you get what you want, helps me get what I want. Well, it, you're bringing me back to, again, this aspect of winning or, or not. Say so You mentioned it in regards to marriage. Like if you're in marriage to win, you're, you're already out of luck. Um, in conflict, being honest with to my focus, what drives you, is it to connect? Is it for a mutual, as you said, a, a mutual win or is it literally just a win? I mean, I don't, I don't think people are out on the, the football field uh, and they're not figuring out how to have a mutual win. No, they want to win. Okay. Different animal. Fair? Exactly. Oh, absolutely. Now, the thing, on the football field, you want to win. It, that is a, you know, one side wins, one side loses. But in, in life, wherever there's a relationship, particularly wherever there's an ongoing relationship, which is 95% of the situations we get involved in, in the family, at work, you know, there's not just this one transaction. You win now, you know, and you win, 
you win, you know, by dominating, you're going to yeah. get payback, you know? Yeah. So, so it's actually, uh, it's actually in our interest because life is not zero sum. Life is an expandable pie. There's always more to go around if you're creative. And that's the key thing is we have to tap a conflict. What we tend to do is we tend to, you know, we tend to think there are, there are no solutions here. There's nothing. There's just no way out. And you shut off the creative part of your brain. But we all have that creative part of the brain that we use all the time. We have to bring that to bear in the situations in which and say, there's got to be more than one option here. There's got to be, you know, just brainstorm for a moment. Think about it. Okay. Well, that feels like it brings us to the next piece here, which is the third side looking for more. And what I took from that bill is I was studying that. And I'll, and I'll tell you, you know, conceptualizing balcony and bridge, I felt like as I was studying your book and the message, I felt like, okay, I, I can, I mean, I obviously had questions, but I can conceptualize that third side was more difficult for me. Now I, I, I got it from an aspect of, of kind of like that creativity and I, and the concept of it's not, it's not just me, you, us, uh, you know, me and them, it's us. I've got to bring an us in that, but even to the aspect of other people. And now you, the three points you had on that is host, help, and a uh, swarm. And yeah, that was my notes, not me, them, but, but an us concept. So bring that into, give us uh, again, a, a story or analogy or concept of what you're talking about. Uh, again, it, folks, it, he has it listed as this is the third side and this is the third aspect of uh, this concept of possibility. Yeah. So basically what we're doing in, on the path to possible is we're opening up potential. Balcony is about opening up the potential within us that exists inside of us, right? The ability, that calm, that perspective, ability to see clearly, understand what drives us. Bridge opens up the potential between us, you know, the potential for mutual gain, the potential to arrive at solutions that can work for both sides, right? Oftentimes, that's hard to do in conflict. It's hard to go to the balcony. We've been talking about that. It's often hard to, to build a bridge. I mean, you know, it's not, not easy when things get tough. So we need help. And where does help come from? Help can come from what I call the third side, which is in conflict situations, we tend to reduce everything to two sides. It's us versus them, me versus you, right? It's always like two sides, Arabs versus Israelis, labor versus versus management, Republican, Democrats, you name it. It's always two, right? And what we forget is that there's always a third side, which is the larger whole. It's all of us. It's Americans. It's human beings. It's the family. It's the kids. It's, I mean, the third side could be, you mentioned God. You know, the third side is that larger whole that reminds us that we're all part of that. We're all part of one thing. And, and the way act, you activate it is, you know, you turn to the people around us, you get stuck, you know, um, we, we all get our blind corner. So you turn to someone like a coach, right? A coach is a third sider, someone who can kind of be on the balcony, who's a little bit removed from the situation, someone around us who can help us think about how we're going to transform this difficult conflict. And it, and, and oftentimes when things are really tough, you need to build a winning coalition of people around that third side. You know, I'll, I'll give you really appreciated this once when I went to Africa. Oh, many, many years ago, I went to work in South Africa on the whole situation, the whole war that was going on there around apartheid. But then I went up into Botswana and Namibia because I'd always wanted to spend some time with the indigenous people that, you know, the, the San, they're sometimes called the Bushmen because they live as hunter gatherers, which is the way that, human beings live for 99% of our time on earth. So if you want to understand human nature, you better understand hunting and gathering. And they live in these communities of, you know, families, like five families in a network, maybe, you know, 25 people, and then in a, a group of 500. And I was curious about the way they deal with conflicts because all the hunters use these poison arrows. And uh, that is kind of a beetle dung that they, and, and the poison you know, if someone gets angry, all they have to do is pick up an arrow and shoot someone and it'll take that person three days to die. They have time to pick up an arrow and shoot someone else. You know, you lose two, three men, you've lost, you know, you know, 50% of your hunt, your little hunting group's capacity. You know, so what do they do? They all have the equivalent like of a, like a, almost like a nuclear weapon there at, at, you know, at that scale. 
And what they do is they treat conflict. They, you know, it's not just belongs to the individuals, the parties. It's the responsibility, not just of the individuals, but also of the community. So whenever people hear emotions get high and voices get raised, someone goes and hides the poison arrows out in the desert. And then they all gather around in a circle, all the men, the women, even the kids, and they talk and they listen and they'll they'll go on for days and they'll ask the, you know the, the the you know the higher power for 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 counsel they'll do everything possible but they create a container a community container within which even the the hardest conflicts can gradually be transformed so they have a whole system and it's based on the third side and it suddenly it was like a light bulb went on for me that's our oldest human heritage that's our birthright and we forget it in our societies because we often tend to think it's us versus them. But there's all of us and, and around us, the, the untapped potential. So that in a conflict, you know, I think about, uh, I don't know, I'm, you know, my wife and I were having trouble, I don't know, years ago with my teenage son. You know, he was falling over the wrong crowd. I don't know, he, they were all lost and there was some drinking, whatever. And, and, you know, it was causing a lot of conflict in the family. And we were at our wits' end. We didn't know what to do. But you know, was it, you know, we weren't enough. So, but we had to get a community response. So we 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 sat him down and said, you know, we, you can't live at home anymore because you know he was bringing, you know, having parties at home, breaking. So we said, we're sending you away for a couple of months. Go spend time with family, with your uncles. We're part of the community. So, so you know, let them talk with you. You know, go to a you know kind of a a, a workshop on self responsibility, self knowledge with a therapist, with a community of, of, of other peers. And there was a whole community response. When he came back two months later, I mean, I'm not saying it works for everyone, but he was, I've never seen a personal transformation like that. I mean, he was like, he got into his music, he got into his tennis, his sports, his studies. And, you know, and it was a flip, but it wasn't something we could just do alone in our little family unit. We needed help from the larger third side. I Okay, so you've got me thinking on on a tangent, not a tangent, uh, but but a piece of this, Bill, with your story there of the the Bushmen, in essence, of them. Here's the conflict. Knowing the possibility that this could get ugly that, to the death, uh, and it actually, I'm 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 correlating that with another story you told in the book that I, I can't remember exactly where it was, but it was a, a war zone you were in, uh, you, you know. Some guys go by and, and want, want to ask a question, uh, whatnot, and you find out that why did it start of this? I think it was a border issue. And, uh, and so you write about this in the book and, you know, somebody killed one of their guys. So they killed one of their guys. And you said, well, what's happened since then? Well, they've killed two more of our guys. And so they're going to go back over. Okay. And you had a point on there, but I'm going to come back to this one that with your Bushmen, I have this concept of them understanding the gravity of this. So here's a conflict that could very likely lead to this person shooting this person with an arrow. They're going to die. It's going to take three days. In the meantime, they're going to kill somebody else. So this is the gravity of a handful of lives right off the bat. That's worth all of us stopping what we're doing and coming together for three days to meet like this. Your son, there was enough gravity or you gave it enough gravity to pull in other people and how often in our lives and I'll own it in my life, look at something. And if that were brought up, I go, Oh my gosh, come on. It's not that big of a deal. Do we really seriously we're going to, you know, call a family meeting or an intervention or get a counselor or whatever and go, yeah, what could the, co I guess, the, I guess the idea is counting the costs. Yeah. Well, that's it. The thing is, uh, it, it has to be worth it, but you know, first of all, you don't have to get the entire community involved in a smaller thing. Just talk to a friend or talk to a, you know, you know, like uh, business situations, like, you know, the, these two guys are going at it, you know, this. Have, have a friend of each of them who serve as a kind of collective third side say, hey, what's 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 in your interest here? So the third side shows up in any kind of way, but it's like, and you yourself can be a third sider all the time. In fact, parents are third siders all the time with their kids. They just don't realize it. They're always like, you're always mediating between your kids a little bit. And sometimes your kids are meeting among the parents, you know, I, in, in my family, that was a bit that way. So uh, so it depends on the cost, but just think right now of how much conflict is costing us in ways that we don't even imagine. D a lost time, um, a lot of emotions. It's not good for our health. I mean, I mean, conflict actually. You know, I'm sure if 
I don't know whether they've done studies of this, but you know, it just it causes ulcers, it can cause cancer, it cause I mean, if you if you just sit on this all this stuff all the time and you're angry, it it it, it poisons your system. And so conflict actually has all kinds of hidden costs, and then obviously destroys relationships, destroys marriages, destroys families, takes apart workplaces. So I think this is a time when we really, it's worth it. It's more than worth it to get, to get, I, I know there's a kind of reluctance to get others involved and whatever. And it's not about getting others involved as busy buddies, but in a helpful way to say, hey, sometimes we need help. <laughs> and where is that help going to come from? Is it going to come from the third side? And it might come, you know, you mentioned prayer and God, you know, that, that's the third side too. That's, that's the larger whole. Um, and uh, so, so, but I do think that sometimes it's not enough to go to the balcony. Balcony opens the way to building the bridge, but sometimes you need the third side and uh, more often than you think. Well, I'm thinking again about myself. There has been times when even in some, um, some as- aspect of awareness, I'm not completely aware, but I, I, here we are. So I'm on, I've done the balcony. So I'm not, I want to build a bridge. I just don't see how. I, I don't know how, or even if it's on my own limitation, I just can't get out of. I mean, I've definitely been in places where I can't get out of a me and them. I just, I know I should. I'm just, it's just right. an admission. I can't. I we've got to get some help because I'm, I'm so far in a hole that I've got to get some help, and there's no option but a third side. Yeah, that, that's it. And you know, I, I mean. In sports, right? As good as a champion you want to be, you benefit from coaching, right? Yeah. From having a coach. You know, think of a third sider as a kind of coach, yeah. as a kind of like conflict coach. Like, because as you say, I mean, right there, I mean, first of all, you're what I really appreciate about you, Kevin, you're really honest about yourself. You're honest about where you're falling down. And that is that's the essential precondition to actually being able to learn and improve. And once you do that, there's help all around us that we just don't see. Yeah. One of the things, Bill, that stuck out to me on that note is it was a story. And at some point you said, we can, we created this. This is what I wrote down. At least we created this, we can fix this. So if we created this, we can fix this. And it brought me to that, I guess, an aspect of responsibility of saying, I've got to admit that I helped create this. If it wasn't for me, there wouldn't be. If if it wasn't for me stating I like coffee, well, then you would have just had tea and we'd all be good. It's my coffee that started the coffee. I mean, I am a part of it. And so uh, it has me just, I guess, on the concept just of responsibility. Uh, we've got to be able, I, mean, I know it's easy to go to a victim mentality, but it, we're, we're at that back to the self-image, self-awareness, self-confidence, even to be able to do this. I've got to be able to take, if I want to resolve or not to not, doesn't mean we have to resolve it. Does it? We'll, we'll, we'll do that too before we end, but um, we've got to have some aspect of taking responsibility. That's got to come to the forefront here. Absolutely. And uh, going to the balcony is taking self-responsibility. Yeah. Third side is, is the is is the community the people who care about the thing around us saying it's our responsibility to uh, to to try and transform this conflict and and the biggest one of the biggest obstacles in any conflict is the blame game you know it's like we just get the blame game you're to blame you're to blame you're to blame and that goes nowhere and in fact if we can take responsibility and say look you know, I don't know, maybe I've only got 1% of this or whatever it is. It doesn't matter. I'm co-creating this situation. <laughs> I'm co-creating this conflict. That actually gives us power. Once we take responsibility, we actually have power to influence it. When we play the blame game, oddly enough, we're disempowering ourselves. Okay. I'm going to bring that out. And I, I forgot about that. That's actually where I started off in the book. And it was my first note, but I got so in, into other stuff. One of your first opportunities came from uh, something that you, you had done in your, in your youth somewhat. And you were asked, uh, you know, how to tell if negotiations were going poorly or well, or you came out with some thoughts on, on that. 
and you said, well, gosh, if you're, so let's, let's take you a bill and you're watching a, a negotiation. If it's in business, if it's within two countries, or if it's a husband and wife, and you say, okay, how, how to tell if they're going poorly or well. And you said, well, gosh, if it's going poorly, uh, there's blame. Just what you said, blame mired in the past and focused on what's wrong. If it's going well, you said, not talking about the past, uh, but talking about the present and the future. And instead of focusing on what's wrong, focusing on what can be done instead of attacking each other and ta- attacking the problem jointly. Honestly, that pair, that segment right there is that's worth the price of admission. Got, folks go buy the book just for that. Uh, that was profound. I mean, that covers so much of this right there. That's it. That's yeah. it. Uh, you yeah. know, so oftentimes when we imagine like a conflict negotiation, it's almost like, one person's on one side of the table, the other person's on the other side of the table. Why not be on the same side of the table facing the problem in all its difficulties, yeah. Yeah. but actually attacking it together rather than attacking each other? You're much more likely to, to get to a better outcome for all sides. It's so powerful. One last thing I do want to hit here because it came out of my mouth a minute ago was conflict res- resolution. That's what we... That's what I have until I read your book. That's what I've thought of. Okay, what's the point with conflict? What's conflict resolution? You said a little bit ago that the point is not always to agree or the opportunity. It may not be. Uh, well, I know, again, the book's about possibilities, but sometimes there may not be a possibility for uh, agreement, but we can still do something positive. So tell us about that in the aspect of, because that's somewhat revolutionary or, 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 or contradictory to our thoughts. Seriously, we can come in, you and I can go talk about coffee and tea and we may not have conflict resolution. Well, then what the heck do we have? So, Well, the, this is the thing. Um, we get fixated. I, I entered the field of conflict resolution. The, and almost the, the idea of resolution is it's all over. You end the conflict, right? And in fact, with a lot of the conflicts that we engage in, they're ongoing situations, you know. There's there's ongoing creative tensions between us because we have differences, right? And so we don't always have to. We don't have to resolve everything. We don't have to agree on everything. We need the the key opportunity, the key choice we have is to transform the way in which we deal with it, because if we can deal with it healthily, by talking about it, by listening to each other, by finding creative ways forward. We can continue to live with these situations because a lot of these situations, you know, Republicans, Democrats, they're always going to be in conflict in some sense. But can the question is, can we deal with our differences in a healthy way that allows the whole country to, to, to do well? And, 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 and that's what I found in almost every the war situations. The war ends, the conflict continues, but the war ends. In other words, you continue to deal with your differences by talking them out rather than by fighting it out. It's so interesting. It makes me think of the little coexist bumper stickers you see on cars that we're talking about. It didn't say resolve conflict or agree on everything, but just figure out how to coexist. And as we're sitting here talking, we're uh, mere days away from Christmas where a lot of people are going to be with family members and friends that they're, they are not going to resolve conflict. They are not going to agree on stuff, but for the love of God, can we, can we just coexist for a meal? Uh, so it's high time for that. Uh, this is, it's just great. I thank you. I mean, this is, uh, you know, I'm selfish with my show. Yeah. It's, uh, it's Kevin's therapy journey here and asking the questions that I want and feel like, gosh, I need, you know, for myself. So folks, as you're listening to this, again, the book is called possible how we survive and thrive in an age of conflict. And as of this show being published, it will have just been, uh, just been made available. So you can go find that on Amazon and whatnot. And, uh, you know, is there any, uh, Bill, any other uh, place that you would have people connect with you outside of the book or is that the primary place to go? Well, I have a website too. If people want to go to it, it's uh, just my name, William at WilliamUry.com. That's U R Y, and uh, and yeah, I I just want to say, Kevin, what a huge pleasure it is to have this conversation with you. As you can feel your your honesty, your your desire to learn, and and if we all had a little bit of that, I think we'd all be doing a lot better. Well, thank you. Again, that's, that's why I'm, I have the best job ever. I get to come and uh, and grow in the areas from the people that I would most uh, most want the influence from. It, your book is 
is uh, incredible how it's structured. Yeah, I, I do want to say again, folks, it's it, the the stories. You'll be fascinated. So not only are you going to learn, but it's just the fact. I'd sell somebody just out of a out of an entertainment standpoint or a, an interest standpoint to read the books and the stories, but then they so drive home these aspects. So folks, as you're listening to this and you get value from it, uh, let us know. Let me know. Let uh, Bill know. And leave us a review on or a rating on Spotify, a review on Amazon. And don't just say, hey, the show was great overall. To say this show, this is what I got. And uh, I'll forward that on to Bill so he can see that as well. Uh, you can watch this show that we just did and watch us talk here. Watch the clips. Find me on YouTube or social media, just kevinmiller.co. Uh, and if you want to master your own inner drive, check out my book, as always, What Drives You on Amazon. And until next time, stay driven. Yeah.